Welcome to another episode of Judgment Date. If you feel confused about what has been going on with regard to the pandemic, vaccines, and where we stand in this country and the world at large, you presumably won't be your own because yours truly absolutely has no idea what's going on. So I want thought, why not try to find somebody who actually does know uh, a lot more than we do and basically to become an old friend because he's so wonderfully gracious about accepting interview uh, in, invites to come onto this program, Professor Francois Fenter from the Wits Medical School. Francois, sorry, I don't even know where to start, but let me try to start uh, as follows. Let's leave the vaccine aside for the moment. My understanding um, from Shabir Mahdi, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that what the latest research, the AstraZeneca research showed, was it's unlikely that we're going to be able to attain herd immunity for the vaccine by the end of the year, if, if not 2022, he was talking about even. Is that correct? Have I got that right? So it all depends on how much vaccine we can get out. I, I think it's very unlikely. I, I agree with him. I think that, so there are two ways to get herd immunity. Essentially, everyone's going to have to, get, it looks like everyone's going to have to get this virus. That's the bad news. There's no such thing as elimination of the virus. It's just too widespread. So there are two ways to get it, or to get the immunity. It's either get the thing and roll the dice, as we've discussed, you know, around getting sick and dying or getting the vaccine. So we're all going to have to acquire immunity at some point, unless you just don't leave your house. That's the only way you actually going to guarantee it. But we are going to come into contact with this virus eventually over the next few years. Um, and we can do that in several ways. We can either just vaccinate everyone as quickly as humanly possible, which is sort of fast tracking that level of immunity, or we've just got to have wave after wave after wave. And it does seem to be a kind of a seasonal thing at the moment. Uh, everything I say is under you know, the review because uh, like we really uh, you know, we get taught a new thing about every other minute with this damn virus. But at this rate, we're probably going to need six to eight waves to get anything close to herd immunity that we would hope to get. That's scary. So with the next, when you talk about seasonal, that means as soon as the seasons start changing again, um, yeah, summer into autumn, we can expect Just, another wave to hit us. Yeah, so if it looks similar to what happened last time, so if June, July, the first wave hit us, hit the Western Cape first and the Eastern Cape first and then spread to the rest of the country. We saw exactly the same, well, very similar pattern hit us over December and January. It seems to be, it seems to have been worse over this December, January. And if it, that wave, which has happened in many other countries, is kind of a six month seasonal thing, which we've seen with some of the, the pandemic flu, we can anticipate another wave in, in June, July. How big that wave is, is your guess is as good as mine. But if that is the case, the chance of us being prepared in terms of vaccinations is very, very low in terms of herd immunity, which is why Shabir and others have been saying, let's focus on the people who are most at risk, who are most at risk of dying. And that's the older people, the people with comorbidities, you know, the stuff we've discussed before. Pivot away from trying to get herd immunity, anticipate that it's going to take most of 2021 and, two, and a good chunk of 2022 to mop up all the vaccination schedules that we need. So let me just ask you then, um, so the objective as I understand it, if we're sensible, would be apart from the health workers to, to see if we could vaccinate as quickly as possible that cohort of people who are most vulnerable to reduce death and hospitalization, I take it. That's right. So the older people, diabetics, people with uncontrolled comorbidities, it's really those groups of people, even amongst healthcare workers, there's a bit of a debate about do we really need to prioritize healthy healthcare workers or people not really front frontliners like me, you know, I sort of sit around and answer and on Zoom calls all day, or somebody who's 20 years old might not actually be the priority at this point. We would rather take a 60 year old healthcare worker or 75 year old nurse and make sure that they're in the front of the queue. So the people who really are at risk are the ones we need to prioritize. Now, now we don't know, I suppose, it would be a fair question to ask you, we have no idea how long that will take because we still don't know when we're going to get how much vaccine and when. We'll so I know everyone's feeling a bit bleak at the moment. I'm actually feeling quite upbeat. Firstly, oh, wow. speed. Easy, you know. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the first thing is like the speed of the science has been astounding. You know, to have several vaccines. I, in some ways, the, the, the initial data on vaccines was so encouraging that I think people are holding the current set of vaccines to a standard which is unreasonable and unscientific. So to have a working functional vaccine in nine months is unbelievable. To have several yeah. candidates, every single one of which look wonderful, 
Yeah, you know, I, 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 I made this analogy on one of the radio shows a few weeks ago. It's like when people say oh, AstraZeneca versus Moderna versus Pfizer, it's like having a luxury car and you know, and complaining about the size of the, the cup holders. It really is that kind of level of, you know, these vaccines are all phenomenal in terms of what they're doing at the moment. So that's speed. The other thing that reassures me is the speed of manufacturing of the, of the vaccine seems to have, have, have increased dramatically. It's still nowhere close to where we need to be. But the kind of redeployment of resources, it sounds like other drug companies are now starting to talk about taking the patents across. That's also very, very encouraging. The fact that South Africa's got 20 million Pfizer vaccines on their way with a plan to actually deploy them. You know, people have been so focused on these industrial level freezers that we need to have, but there actually is a plan for defrosting these things that actually getting into the arms of people who need them. So all of that stuff is encouraging. So if we get 20 million vaccines from Pfizer, um, they need a double shot, is that right? That's right, so 10 million people would be protected. But that it's basically still... would, but that would take care of your healthcare workers and all your comorbidities, would it not? Absolutely, you know, so, uh, you know, as opposed to America and Europe where you chunk their populations in that kind of older age range, which is so vulnerable, our population is much younger. So the number of people over 65 is much smaller. We have probably more diabetics, sadly, but it's, um, but those, as you say, 10 million should cover pretty much everyone who's 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 very vulnerable. And then the, the other vaccines probably mop up everybody that's left um, that's still sort of creeping into the comorbidity range. So is it possible then um, that if we could get the 20 million relatively quickly, that at least for the people who are the that re range that we're talking about, that this year they could be vaccinated? Yeah, absolutely. If we, even if we got um, less than 20 million, we could probably take care of a huge chunk of the vulnerable population as long as we can convince them to get in and have the health facilities equipped to actually deal with that. I think we could take care of the scary stuff, you know, that fear factor I have of killing my father or of, mm. you know, my diabetic uh, domestic worker being sick or something, you know, that, that kind of thing that we're all wrestling with at the moment. It doesn't mean that we're not going to get long COVID and all the other stuff, but we can at least mitigate the horror that we've had in the last year, particularly over December. Okay. It was terrible. So there are a couple of questions that emerge from that. The first is, I'm, I'm interested because you seem quite positive that the government actually now, on some particular basis, not only will be able to procure the 20 million Pfizer, but actually have some kind of infrastructural logistical plan to store them and distribute them. Now that's, so, a, that's a far cry from a month ago, just over a month ago, when everybody thought that they were literally making it up as they went along. Look, I think there is some truth in that, making it up as they go along. And I think that some of this, you know, the thing is we do have some infrastructure, both in the public health care system as mm -hmm. well as in the private health care system. And I think the, the kind of politicking and posturing that we saw, especially towards the end of last week, uh, of last year, kind of dissolved in the face of, you know, the fact, for a fact that there clearly wasn't a plan. And I think everybody with experience actually came to the table and starting to come up with it. There's lots of things that can go wrong, you know, and we saw this with the AstraZeneca um, consignment that came to us, that we have to have, where government actually didn't have control of that situation, but they have control over a lot more. So I am quite hopeful that people will start pivoting. And we've seen even in public health systems that have weren't doing very well initially, like in the UK, that they've stepped up around vaccinations and are actually doing a pretty good job of getting people through the door. That's not to detract from the enormity of the task. It's, you know, we're talking about several hundred thousand people a, a week who are going to have to be vaccinated, um, you know, going forward for the rest of this year. And that's, I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. I, mean, I was trying to work it out how much you'd need, but I mean, if you, I mean, if, if you take 50,000 a day, just as a simple proposition, that's only 350,000 a week. Yeah, um, and you can multiply that, and 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 you know, ten weeks is three point five million. Um, you know, forty weeks is fifteen. Not enough. Yeah. No, it's not enough for two thousand twenty-one. And and that's a pretty big amount of people for South Africa to vaccinate on a daily basis. So at the moment, we vaccinate about five thousand people a day. So it's a shed load in terms of increases. There's no way the public health care system is going to be able to expand. You know, it's, when you go to these vaccination clinics, it's not like they're not busy. They, you know, the queues of kids being vaccinated all the time. And now we've got to get adults through the system. This is why things like getting the private sector pharmacies involved, just different mechanisms, employers. You have trying to find creative ways of just increasing the capacity to vaccinate so, dramatically. So, 
you know, for example, obviously the large employers, they could they could administer. I take it that the discims and the clicks of this world could when I go and get my flu injection from clicks, would there be any reason why they wouldn't be able to give me a vaccine if they had it? Uh, and so, no, I you know, they give vaccinations at the moment, like you. I that's where I stop is at my local private pharmacy. Yeah. I just pop in yeah. and buy the thing on there. If there's a nurse there, they stab me. And you know, some of the logistically is going to be harder is that we're going to have to capture some of this information to make sure that people get their second dose because most of these vaccines have a second dose requirement so that people don't fall out of the system. So there is some bureaucratic controls which are going to be in place, which are greater than say for the vaccine. And then just the sheer number of people. But yeah, employers, one of the concerns we do have is that you know there might be a whole of worried well people who are wealthy who can buy this, themselves out of the out of the, the danger zone. We can't have a situation where some 80 year old is not getting a vaccine because some 20 year old is neurotic and is rushing to the front of the queue. We need those kind mm. of equity issues. But then again, pharmacists are amongst the most legal people in the world. They probably the most comply with the rules, far more so than my profession does. So I'm fairly confident that between the employers and the pharmacies, it'll take care of a big percentage of the, of the patient load. Now, before I get onto the consequence of the vaccine, let me just ask you a question which intrigues me, and I am thinking it intrigues a lot of people. Um, all of a sudden on Sunday, uh, arrived at the webinar, which was a crucial webinar, both professors Mardi and Gray. <laughs> I take it that you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but it did seem to me very encouraging that the government was now bringing in its best virologists and its most distinguished scientists into the pool which indicates for me, I, I take it my reading, you would share that reading, that now the urgency of this matter has basically means any ideological and ridiculous disputes that might've been in the past are less important than getting people vaccinated as quickly and thickly as possible. No, I think they're out of the wilderness and the country desperately needed their expertise, particularly those two, you know, they're probably the yeah, most vaccine literate people are around. I think there've been several missteps. I think that um, Shabir actually was one of the, I really have a huge amount of trust in his, because he's the one who called this in many of the MAC meetings, other things. He said, you know, we're bringing a whole of ST, uh, HIV experts to advise on a respiratory virus, which was a mistake. And then brought in a whole of people who didn't have to actually have that much experience with vaccines, um, which I think was a series of missteps. I think actually, to government's credit, I think they finally realized that in the that ghastly first week of January, when it was clear that all of these things hadn't happened. I also think there's been, a, within the various procurement agencies and things, a lot of hard questions being asked in the background, you know, where it was clear that they just weren't prepared. Um, yeah. And that's, a lot of that stuff seems to have been swept aside. And I think at this point, particularly the politicians have realized that ideology hasn't served them well here. So I'm, I'm very pleased. I think the country should be pleased. Certainly, I've been encouraged by far more openness to the discussions and the kind of open webinars and things. That, that no, happened. no, it's, it's, it's incredibly encouraging. And in fact, for the first time, it seems to me that despite all the confusion, there's a real attempt at accountability, which yeah. is very important. And it'd be very churlish to simply uh, keep on repeating old criticisms when in fact there's been a total uh, kind of glasnost almost in this situation. The second question I wanted to then ask you was, I mean, obviously people are confused about this. I get asked about it, I know. Um, so I'm asking somebody who does know. So the AstraZeneca vaccine, as I understand it, it clearly doesn't work particularly well on the variant for a mild and moderate. But people say, well, won't it work for people with serious, will it not prevent serious illness? Is it that we just don't know that, that why can't use it? I mean, why would one not use it for that purpose? So we don't know for certain that's going to stop the, the, from the new variant. I. Now I'm going to go into speculative virology and immunology. To my mind, we're all going to have to get it eventually. And it seems like with all coronaviruses, they circulate, you get it. You either have to stop it spreading from the very beginning, and we're way beyond that phase. So the first SARS, the SARS-CoV-1, they were able to contain it and it disappeared and became extinct, we hope. Um, SARS-CoV-2 just has gone everywhere. It's now circulating. It's at the stage where, unless you're an island nation like New Zealand and you cut yourself off for the rest of time, you, are, you and I and all of us are going to get it eventually. And either in, so I'm on this vaccination study, if I've got the real thing, I'm probably, the next time I get it, it's going to be very, very mild. I might have a snotty nose. I might have a sore throat. I might feel a bit fluey for a couple of days. I'm not going to get that terrible SARS-CoV-2 that's, that's, that's been put forward there. So the sort of projections around this is that we have to get the virus eventually. And that primary immunity, that first infection is either that terrible rolling the dice 
or it's to get the vaccine. And to my mind, this is why the AstraZeneca discussion, people are holding up the AstraZeneca, these variants, there are so many of them around already. The fact, you know, the South African one was, was described, I know it's politically incorrect to call it the South African variant, but I'm afraid it was the South African people who actually called it the South African variant initially, so they only have themselves to blame. That um, there's the Brazilian variant, there's the UK variant, there are probably a dozen different variants, and over the next little while, we're going to have more and more variants. So what happened to the AstraZeneca um, vaccine, I suspect, is going to happen with other variants to the other vaccines inevitably. What we have to focus on is how many people died on the vaccine arm and how many people got hospitalized, how many people got really sick. I'm not vaccinated, I'm not getting vaccinated to stop myself getting a sore throat. I'm getting my vaccinated to stay off the ventilator. And that's what people need to get their heads around is that that primary vaccination is to stop that first assault on your immune system and rolling the dice. So that when you do roll the dice, it's going to be a very minor you know, it's going to be a 50-sided dice rather than a six-sided dice. And that's what is probably going to happen. The circulating virus is going to come and hit us again and again. And in 10 years' time, you and I are going to get it as just a normal sore throat that we have every single winter. And was that whether because, we, is that because I would have been vaccinated? That's because you've either been vaccinated or you've had the primary um, infection and you survived it. And that's what I don't want. I don't want to get that primary infection and survive it. Well, if you've got comorbidities like me, you sure as hell don't want to get it. You so the, definitely don't. You desperately need the vaccine. So, the, so, so let me just go back. The AstraZeneca one, what was the reason for saying, well, is it because we just don't know that, that it's no point giving it? Let me put, the, let me, let me put a, a proposition to you and, and, and see what you think about it. So I understand perfectly that it doesn't, we know that the data tells us it doesn't help with mild and moderate. We don't know for certain what it does with serious in relation to the variant. Would it be such that it would be rather cavalier to then use it to find that it actually doesn't help at all, in which case you then play into the arms of the anti-vaccinators? No, absolutely. And that, that is some of the complexity. The way I think about it is the safety profile in AstraZeneca vaccine is unbelievable. In fact, all of them are just remarkable. So what's the worst that we're going to do? is that we're going to give you a vaccine that's very, very safe that didn't work. That's the absolute, absolute worst thing that can happen. The, and that is incredibly implausible. Everything we know about vaccines, everything we know about this virus, everything we know about, know about the coronaviruses suggests that will provide you with um, protection at least from the severe forms of the infection. So to my mind, I agree with Shabir. We must take a bit of a leap of faith here. We're not... We know the situation where we've got 50 choices of these vaccines. There are a million of them in the country. We have people like you, a million diabetics out there who are scared of getting this thing, who we can frontline. It doesn't stop you from getting another vaccine in the future. So to my mind, to, to send these back would be a, a silly mistake. I, you know, a friend of mine was um, just joking the other day. He's from, they're getting these vaccinations in Boston. He says, there is a queue of people outside. So we talk about the anti-vaxxers, but they're almost the other extreme as well, the pro-vaxxers, which are hit me baby with anything you've got. And I think that play to that, like go to people and say, listen, we can't be certain that this thing's going to work, but you're a diabetic, you're on the older side. We know it's not going to hurt you. Why don't you? Yeah, I mean, that's my like, point. If it's not going to hurt me, why don't you just give it to me? I'd rather take my chance. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's it maybe it's a 50-50 chance of working, which is rather more than, uh, 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 which is which is better than nothing, I suppose. Yeah, but, absolutely. But because, because so that follows the next question. If once we do get vaccinated and understand from Professor Gray that the J and J one is very effective against um, the variant in relation to death and hospitalization. So does it, even for people like myself, and maybe many, many people listen to this in my position, the diabetics and got comorbidities, if we get that vaccine, is it also more than likely, I mean, obviously there'll be exceptions, that we will also suffer flu in the ordinary course, but we won't die? You mean the COVID flu, the kind of COVID yes. infection? Yeah. What I'm trying to say is if we get a vac that vaccine, which I'm taking on the empirical evidence is actually pretty effective in relation to that, for, um, for, for, for death and hospitalization. It will help people like myself at least survive, even if we may be ill for a week. And more, look, being ill for a week is quite staunch, you know, for okay. in terms of what we're seeing. The mild to moderate disease often sick for a few days, like a bit of a no, high okay. temperature and things. No, so okay. yeah, absolutely. It's gonna start, it's gonna keep you out of hospital, which in South Africa, 
is a level of hospitalization which is far more severe than say in the UK or the US. You know, you pretty much have to be on oxygen by the time you, you get hospitalized, yeah, particularly in the public service. But it's gonna keep you more than that. It's, you're likely to have a very mild illness. You know, you might have a sore throat, you might be knocked out, you might be off your legs for a couple of days. But honestly, that happens to me two or three times a year with, you know, No, with, no, no, with no, no, I have the same, I suffer the yeah. same, absolutely. That's so let me then move on, Francois, what I, what I wanted to then ask you is this, um, uh, le taking the fact that we have got a longer, I mean, we have in our longer time span before everybody gets this thing one way or the other, um, there, and as you say, there's likely to be a third wave. What do we do uh, with regard to the third wave? Are we going to land up by having some other kind of level three lockdown yet again? So uh, the the sad way, I look, I hate. We, as or you should know. we or should we be maintaining some form of regulatory system now? Uh, yeah. hopeless. I don't know. I mean, I'm, no, I think that uh, you're completely right. I think that the mass gatherings are clearly the way. Indoor mass gatherings are, and then indoor family gatherings are the two major spreaders. Um, the kind of beach distraction we had, we can discuss, but the, you know, those are, that's not where the, the, the transmissions are happening. To my mind, there is a role for locking down. I hate the phase levels of lockdown. Because yeah, yeah. In rural, in the first waves, there were, there were rural areas that saw two or three cases per hospital and then got hammered in the second wave. So what I think is just a, a really clever surveillance system. So if it hits the Western Cape first and three weeks later, it's Gauteng. Why must Gauteng lock down? You know, why the Western Cape should be locked down first when they've got their first cases. So having an intelligent provincial system that can say, look, it's flaring here. Let's just be more careful here. Let's start the curfewing over there to protect the hospital services and also to stop the mass spreading events where, which are which are all over the place. So I think just a more intelligent system around curfews, around restrictions is probably the way to go. And, you know, and to get public trust in that process. In the meantime, I think it would be really dumb to go to big, to, firstly, to throw away your mask or to go to big congregated indoor events. You know, what we're doing at the moment, just stay away from the mass events until we've got, and particularly if you're vulnerable. In your case, you know, in the case of my family who are elderly and who have comorbidities, they're the people we must be trying to protect the most. So, so on that particular point, I mean, what was curious for many people, and perhaps it's a question about the lessons learned, is when the, when the second wave hit, there was a press conference in which we were informed about this variant and that the view was taken that was more transmissible, more easily transmissible. But it took about two weeks thereafter for the government to react. And some people say by the time they reacted, the, the actual peak was already going down. Yeah. And that, the, the reaction should have come much earlier and we could have saved some more lives than we did. Is that a fair criticism? I think it's a fair criticism. I, 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 you know, for all the criticism I've heaped on government, I, there's some forgiveness. This unprecedented times. I'm not Very sure hard, I would have done yeah. a better job if I was in the minister's shoes in terms of that cause. There are other things which she's done which I'm, I am quite critical of. But I think just having, the, we've got really good surveillance systems in place. So I think now we've learned our lesson. We need to intelligently gauge this and anticipate so what so i've said you know watch out for june july the countries which have had a very high many countries in europe such as holland and germany where their first wave came down but they've had very high levels of infection in between mm. which we didn't actually have you also have countries like portugal that went into a second wave and then went almost immediately into a massive third wave so we need to be nimble enough to be able to handle all of those scenarios so at the moment it we... looks like june july but I might be wrong. February, the end of February might be a horror show that we've never anticipated. And so why, why is it, uh, is it that every country is different? I mean, we seem to have remarkably, I mean, if we look at, if I look at the figures of December, January, and I was particularly looking in the Western Cape, where it was like 4,000 a day, and now it's down to about 200 a day. Why is it that we seem to actually have these, uh, whereas like in the States or elsewhere, they seem to have much higher levels consistently than we've had. So no, it's a, it's a fair comment. The Asian countries which have barely been touched, you know, despite yeah. being very crowded and not, you know, it, it's, it, there are certain things about the biology of this virus that we still, we're still trying to find out about. And, and I, I don't have it. Even if you look at the provincial distribution in South Africa, the Western Cape got severely hammered in the second wave. While some of the other provinces like Gauteng had a wave which was only slightly greater than that. So who knows if they're genetic things, if there's something about the, you know, all the stuff we speculated right at the beginning of the epidemic, something about the climate, who knows? 
you know, what actually, I think all of that stuff is going to slowly disseminate. It's very frustrating though, because planning is so difficult, you know, and if, when do you pause and take a breath of relief and go back to normal? You know, that's, yeah. and that's where the vaccine is the one hope that's being dangled is like, finally, I can see a situation in the future. I don't know whether it's going to be in two years time or 10 years time that we can throw away the mask and we can congregate in a way that the way we, we used to, you know. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, can I ask you then just, uh, um, you know, a, a moving slightly uh, um, ancillary point. Of course, uh, people are also desperate for treatment whilst they can't get the vaccine in hospitals. And there's been a whole brouhaha about this ivermexin right. uh, drug, uh, which I thought was sort of good for my dog. I didn't realize that I... That I very good for your dog. If, um, my, my dog, Fergie... My dog Fergie is very cross that you can't get it at the same price anymore. <laughs> but, but, but the question is, is it, I mean, does these sort of things, how, there's no consistent scientific evidence about this. So is it, does it worry scientists when we get these sort of fads or is it something where what the hell, let's try it? So there's a big debate about this. I, I mean, the ivermectin thing aside is that there is, it's yeah. very faddish. And I'm afraid a lot of my colleagues are, incredibly excitable. They kind of whipped off everything off the back shelf um, and just kind of added it to, to the concoction because they thought it would work. And it's bizarre some of the things that they've chosen. Ivermectin's leapt into this almost magical moody phase that I don't understand. So we actually assessed Ivermectin in about March, April last year as a whole, what you do with, you know, we don't have new drugs. We're still waiting for them to come. So while the vaccinologists are doing their work, we grabbed a whole lot of drugs and put them in a Petri dish and essentially said, will it work against coronavirus? And Ivermectin did work, but it was very weak and you need massive doses of it to actually get it to work at the kind of levels. So we went off and looked at a whole of other drugs and this thing just leapt into consciousness that I don't quite understand why. And a huge amount of political pressure got put on government and on the regulators and I think the regulator eventually just said, listen, let's rather have it in the in a situation we can monitor than have the veterinary product coming in and people, there have already been some deaths on ivermectin already because we don't know what the dose is. So they've been using industrial level horse doses for, for humans. Sure. So the problem with this is we've been here before. Right? People remember the chloroquine debate and then the mm. zithromycin debate and then the vitamin D debate and all these things. And in fact, vitamin, this fair amount of data suggests that chloroquine combined with azithromycin increased mortality twofold in terms of the people who were given it. So when you happily hand this to people, you know, it used to be with the caveat, we don't know what it's going to do and it could harm you because we have unbelievably poor data. We were reviewing, we wrote an article, in fact, it was published this morning in Ground Up, Nathan Giffen's rag, that um, was... You I know, don't think he'd like that word. <laughs> no, he certainly wouldn't, but I know he's going to be listening to this, so that's why I was you. No, no, that's why. Uh, that's the, why I've got to correct you, because otherwise I'll get a call immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. So Nathan Geffen's very, very important and very, actually, they have, to, I actually think the media have done amazing stuff in this yeah. epidemic. In so, but you wrote science. an article, I interrupted you, 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 you <laughs> wrote an article, please tell me about it. So we wrote this article and this doubling of mortality was actually highlighted by Jeremy Nell. Um, and this article talks about these levels of evidence and the harm that you could potentially do. I know that people are desperate and they are very worried, but I, I think they underestimate how much how implausible it is that this drug is as magical as they're like. We don't have anything in viral medicine that you can take that prevents infection, can treat early infection, and magically get you off a ventilator and back to work in a few days' time, which is what's been claimed with ivermectin. And this is a worm and cocoa medicine that isn't for viruses traditionally. So it's just the whole thing is just implausible to me. And the kind of anecdote that's been thrown around of how wonderful people are and how well they've done it's difficult for me to reconcile. I hope I'm wrong. I hope the stuff yeah. has every one of the magical properties that people, because it is cheap and it is, you know, and the doses that we've currently looked at um, looks like it's pretty, if you know, it's pretty safe, but whether it's effective and also is it safe for the doses people are using is very, very, I certainly wouldn't take it if it was me and I was sick. So just then to round up, um, when I spoke with you uh, late last year, you said to me, if we don't really get vaccinated, uh, significant percentage of the population, you and I, you said, would have a conversation next December about what we're going to do again in our holidays. <laughs> I'm interested whether you think we're going to have a slightly better time, just 
you know, I'm not, I mean, obviously I can't ask you to predict, but I mean, from your gut feel, do you think that because we're going to get, say, 20 million doses of the Pfizer and probably some Johnson & Johnson, um, life won't return to normal, but we will see less deaths and less hospitalizations as the year goes on? I think what's going to happen is I'm not going to be terrified about my father who's in his 70s. I'm not going to be horrified at my colleague who, who's an uncontrolled diabetic or who's on chemotherapy and stuff. I'm not going to be sitting there desperately worried that I'm going to you know, kill somebody inadvertently by, yeah, I did something really dumb over December. I, picked, I was on a conference call coming out from, from a holiday and I picked up a hitchhiker to, you know, I was just giving a lift to. And I was on the call and I forgot about COVID. So I didn't have my mask on because I was traveling alone. He had his mask on, interestingly enough. And we drove for 40 minutes before I realized what I'd done. Now, that's more than adequate time for the transmission of the virus. You just need a slight lapse in concentration. I'm seeing so many people being so judgy about it. It reminds me so much of the HIV wars, you know, where there's so much blame about promiscuity and about how you let your guard down. You're seeing it with COVID as well. You just need a small lapse in concentration. You just need something to go wrong like that. And you can kill, as I said, somebody who's really you really care about. I want that fear gone. I want all the people who are incredibly vulnerable. I, I can take my chances. I actually, in some ways, don't mind. You know, I'm scared of COVID, especially long COVID. But I'm terrified of killing somebody because I let that slight lapse in concentration, which is why I think if we get that out the way, December just will be a little more relaxed than it was this time around. Well, that's good to know. Then just one final question, Francois. I mean, what the variant, what effect did that have on all of the people who got COVID prior to the variant? Are they so, not vulnerable again? So the, again, we don't know, but there's a hang of a lot of data out there to suggest that the, all they got is a very mild infection. One of the best data sets we have is from the healthcare workers in the UK who got COVID and who have serological evidence. Nobody got sick again even with the second wave. So what I said is what we think is going to happen is everyone's either going to get vaccinated or they're going to get COVID and they're going to get very sick. The second time around, you're just going to get a little less sick. Like in fact, a lot less sick in most cases. One or two people are going to be unlucky and they're going to get severely ill, like with most things the second time around. But the data we have is that the second time around, people who've had COVID or have had the vaccine get very, very mildly ill. So what I think you're going to see is that the circulating virus is going to just become part of us you just have to either roll that dice or you're going to have to get a vaccine or you're going to have to hide behind a wall for the rest of, the, of your life. And that, that obviously is not an option. Francois, thank you very much. You have now defied <laughs> a particular proposition that I've always had, which is that doctors are incapable of explaining anything <laughs> in words that normal people can understand. And you have totally explained things with a level of clarity, which not only am I indebted, but everybody who will listen to this will be equally indebted. Thank you so, so much. And thanks for your time yet again. Thank you again. Anytime. The last time we're going to have a chat, but there we are. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>